This morning we're in John chapter 4. We're looking at, a, um, at the account of the healing of the son of a royal official who actually lived in Capernaum. And uh, what we're going to be focusing on this morning particularly is, well, Jesus' interaction with him and with the Jews in particular that um, they should trust him, they should believe him, they should have faith and not demand that they see something miraculous before they will actually trust the Lord. Let's um, just simply read the account in verses 46 through 54. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 46. Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household this is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last week, remember we, not last week, but we've seen in the Gospel of John, Jesus began his ministry at Cana of Galilee. This is where he revealed to his disciples his glory by turning the water into wine. Well, now we see him returning to Cana after his uh, trip to Jerusalem, remember, to cleanse the temple and uh, to have his conversation with Nicodemus and after his trip through Samaria for that uh, providentially arranged encounter with the Samaritan woman. Now last week we saw that he purposely avoided Nazareth because he knew that he would not be received there and that again had to do with the problem of familiarity it's difficult to minister to those who know you better than as it were others that they might be more willing to respect because they are strangers to them so Jesus bypassed Nazareth instead he pushed into the other areas where the people weren't biased against him uh, who had hearts basically that were prepared to believe because they had seen the signs and the miracles that he had performed when he was at Jerusalem. Now in Cana, which is in Galilee, we see that he had another divinely planned encounter with a man from Capernaum whose son was dying. Now here Jesus teaches us one more lesson, a lesson I think that we can, that we can find to be useful in the area of evangelism, but not evangelism only, but to every area of life because it teaches us that we can trust Jesus in everything that he has promised to do. Now what I want us to do is basically look at two things. First of all, the conversation Jesus had with this royal official, and secondly, what Jesus is teaching us here about trusting him. Now first of all, let's consider what Jesus had to say to this royal official. Now John tells us in verses 46 and 47, Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So when Jesus finally arrives, as it were, in Cana, a man who lives in Capernaum, and basically this man was a royal official, which means he was a minister to the king. The king at that time was Herod Antipas, not exactly a friend of Jesus, as you know. Um, he heard about it, this man, and he came looking for, his, for help, for Jesus' help. 
Now, Capernaum, um, we don't have a map in front of us, although it might be helpful to have one, so I'll just kind of describe where this is. But Capernaum is basically where Peter lived. Uh, it was really on the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee. It was at sea level, at least, you know, you might say that at uh, the sea level of, of the uh, Sea of Galilee. While Cana was basically towards the west and a little bit toward the south, up in the hill country, uh, the distance between these two cities is basically 20 to 25 miles and perhaps 1,500 feet in elevation. Now, Jesus had been at Cana of Galilee before, or excuse me, he had been, of course, to Capernaum before. Uh, we didn't actually spend much time on this uh, as we looked at this account before, but after Jesus had done the miracle he did in Cana of Galilee, we read in John chapter 2, verse 12, that he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. By the way, when, when the uh, writers of the, uh, of the scriptures talk about going up and down, they literally mean going up in elevation and down in elevation. Uh, going up to Cana, going down to Capernaum has to do with one being in the hill country and the other actually being at sea level. But Jesus had been to Capernaum before, uh, before this man's son apparently was sick, and we know that Jesus would later actually take up residence there. And having been in Capernaum, Jesus apparently had also done many miracles or many signs there. Uh, last week we noted that uh, he likely went to Nazareth after this visit to Cana of Galilee. And um, we saw that one of the things that the Nazarenes were actually going to say, or one of the things that actually Jesus was going to say to the Nazarenes when he was there in Luke chapter 4, verse 23. No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Basically an indication that Jesus had been performing signs in Capernaum. As a matter of fact, Jesus spent so much time there and he did eventually so many miracles in the city that he singles them out later as being particularly accountable on the day of judgment for their not believing. They had a huge amount of evidence, and yet in spite of that, they didn't receive Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, verses 23 through 24, Jesus says, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, I bring that up simply to say this, that this man who comes to Jesus for help, he came from Capernaum. He lived in Capernaum. He had seen the miracles that Jesus had done, and he knew what Jesus could do. Now his son had become very sick since Jesus left and went down into Judea, went to Jerusalem for the Passover, talked to Nicodemus, talked to the woman at the well of Samaria, and now he was coming to Jesus because he knew Jesus could heal him. Now as I noted just a moment ago, this was no small feat. Uh, it was rel relatively inconvenient to make this trip because the trip was at least 20 miles. It could have been as, as much as 25 miles and it was mostly uphill. And he was willing to make this trip because he believed that Jesus could help and of course was hoping that Jesus would help. Now this makes what Jesus says to him next a little bit puzzling because when he begs Jesus to come and heal his son, Jesus says to him in John 4, 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, it's interesting because Jesus was clearly speaking to this man. Jesus said to him, singular. But he was also speaking to the Jews in general. Unless you, plural, see signs and wonders, you will simply not believe. Now, Jesus said this because this was his usual experience with the Jews. Unless they saw it for themselves, they would not believe. And you know what? Because of that, Jesus was not willing to do signs and wonders for them. We read in, in Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, 
they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. Now he said that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because this was not a matter of weak faith looking for support. Help me, Jesus. But it was unbelief looking for an excuse to keep on not believing. They came in order to test him. That's the reason why Jesus was unwilling to do signs and wonders to the Jews or for the Jews and why he basically issued this rebuke to this man. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Well, that asks us the question, how does genuine faith respond to the Lord? Does it come up saying, show me Jesus and I'll believe? No, basically, it says to Jesus, I believe because you've said it. It responds in the way that Jesus told Thomas he should have responded when his fellow disciples told him that they had seen the Lord and yet he didn't. We'll read later in John's Gospel in John 20, verses 25 through 29. So the other disciples were saying to him, that is to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, and again, note, note this because this was what he had in common with the Jews, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now again, Jesus wouldn't do this for the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but he was willing to do it for Thomas because Thomas was one of his sheep. He had weak faith. And it needed to be strengthened. Thomas belonged to the Lord, but he will not do this for unbelief. Now still, it does seem strange that Jesus would say this to this man because, I mean, he seemed to be exhibiting faith, didn't he? He made a rather long journey to find Jesus. He did it because he believed Jesus could heal his son and he was his only hope. So what was missing? Well, the only thing that really can be pointed to is the fact that he asked Jesus to come down to Capernaum, that Jesus had to be physically present in order to heal his son, that he couldn't just believe Jesus at his word, take him at his word, just, just say the word, Jesus, like the centurion, remember, believed. Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. Don't come to my house. I'm not worthy that you should come. Just say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. Apparently, this man's faith wasn't quite that strong, at least at this point. There may have been another reason, another possibility could be that Jesus was simply pushing this man to see how far his faith would actually go. Remember there was another Gentile, this, this man we're not told is a Gentile, I think he was Jewish. But there was a Gentile woman who came to Jesus who pleaded that he might heal her daughter, that he might deliver her from demon possession. And he was unwilling to do it at first, or at least it seemed that way, until the woman expressed faith. And then he healed that woman's uh, daughter. So perhaps it was a test. But whatever the case, it was certainly one that he passed. He continued to plead with Jesus, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus listened to him. Apparently, he found the faith that he was looking for. And so Jesus says to him, Go. Your son lives. And we read, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he started off. He was no longer insisting that Jesus come down to Capernaum. He trusted that what Jesus said was true. And he left to go back down to Capernaum. 20 to 25 mile walk, this time 
downhill. But he believed that he had received what it was he was after. And you know what? He wasn't disappointed. We read in verses 51 through 53, as he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. In other words, his faith took another leap forward, as it were. And this time, I believe, it went all the way to saving faith. Now, this man believed at least at a level that was enough to get him to go out and seek for Jesus' help. He pleaded with Jesus when Jesus seemed to put him off because he knew Jesus could help and he was the only one who could. And he believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went again back to Capernaum and having believed, he received what he actually trusted Jesus to do. Uh, John concludes in verse 54, this is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee, by which he didn't necessarily mean it was the, only, the second miracle Jesus had done, because he had already done many by this time in Capernaum, in Judea, um, and of course, um, well, I, I think mainly in those areas, but also this is the second one he had done in, in Cana of Galilee uh, after he had turned the water into wine. But because of it, not only did this man believe, but I do want you to notice his whole household believed as well. And this isn't the only situation or occurrence where we find faith coming into the household and everybody in the household believing. Uh, that, thankfully, was not an uncommon occurrence in Scripture. God is merciful. It didn't always happen, but it did on numerous occasions. Now, again, this is what we see in the um, conversation between Jesus and the man from Capernaum. Secondly, I want us to consider what Jesus is teaching us here about trusting him. Now, the first thing I want us to consider is this, that we don't need to see miracles to believe that Jesus is who he said he, he was or is and that he can do what he said he can do. Let's not forget that Jesus did reprove this man and the Jews because they had this attitude. Unless they saw it for themselves, they would not believe. Uh, like Thomas, as a matter of fact. And sadly, oftentimes, we're more like Thomas than like the centurion. They should have believed without seeing. Now we might want to ask, on what grounds should we believe that what Jesus says is true if he doesn't do a miracle to prove himself? Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I, you know, if you're in the sort of the charismatic churches, they, they actually many times teach that you really shouldn't believe unless the Lord proves himself first. And so they expect miracles to take place and those miracles are supposed to engender faith in you so that you'll finally believe. But you know what? The Lord doesn't need to do any more miracles to prove himself to you because he's already done that. We already have grounds to believe the Lord and to trust him. On the grounds of who he is and of course on the grounds of what he has already done to prove who he is. You realize that Jesus did miracles and he did these miracles to establish who he actually was. And he wasn't adverse to pointing to those miracles as his divine credentials to show others that, as a matter of fact, he is the Messiah. Remember when John the Baptist sent messengers because apparently he was having a crisis of faith as well. He was the one who you know, declared, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet in jail, he began to doubt and he sent messengers saying, are you the expected one? Or should we look for someone else? And what did Jesus do on that occasion? He pointed the messengers to the signs he was doing and said, go back and tell John about them. In Matthew 11, verses 2 through 6. Now when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear. And see, the blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, 
and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus wasn't averse to doing miracles. He did many miracles, and he pointed to those miracles to prove that he was the Messiah so that they and we would believe that he is. Now, again, if that's true, why does Jesus reprove the I have to see for myself mentality? Well, he does that, first of all, because most of these requests were coming from people who didn't believe, who were merely looking for an excuse to continue not to believe. But the second reason Jesus said this is because he never really intended for everyone to see his miracles. He never intended to prove from generation to generation that he is the Messiah and that his word is true. He basically intended to prove that once for all by doing the miracles that he actually did that we have recorded in Scripture. He did these miracles and he had them written down by eyewitnesses. And then he wanted everybody to accept that testimony because of the continuing testimony of the Spirit of God. In other words, he, he wasn't intending anymore to do new miracles to prove it, but rather to show us these miracles and to convince us by his Holy Spirit that these things are actually true. Now, ask yourself, have you seen a miracle of, of God, one that was indisputable, one that just shocked you and, and created amazement and fear that you realized could not be done in any other way? Let me tell you, I was in a church for many years that believed miracles were taking place every week and people were claiming that miracles were taking place but you know what, I never saw a miracle. I didn't. I saw people claiming to have miracles. I, I heard people saying I have a warm feeling in my shoulder, I, my back feels better and uh, I had this tumor but it's gone but, but I didn't see anything like what Jesus and his disciples did in scripture because those things weren't happening. They weren't visible, they weren't show-stopping, uh, amazing miracles because Jesus actually doesn't intend that we believe that way. We haven't seen miracles, but do you believe? Do you believe what Jesus says is true? Do you believe God exists? Do you believe Jesus is a son? Do you believe he's the Messiah? Have you trusted Jesus? Why have you if you haven't seen miracles? It's because you know by the Holy Spirit these miracles that he did in the Word are true miracles you know that Jesus is the Son of God. This is why you believe. Now the Roman church in Calvin's day, they believed that the miracles that they thought God was doing through them and through the relics of the saints, you know, the remnants and so forth, that's how they knew a person was a saint if one of their remains actually was the source of a miracle. They, they pointed to these miracles they thought were taking place and they said, we're teaching the truth because we have miracles. And then they ask Calvin, where are your miracles to prove that what you say is from God? Well, when they asked Calvin that question, he pointed to the Bible. And he said, the miracles that Jesus did, the miracles that his disciples have done, prove that the Bible is God's word. And then he pointed to the word to prove that what he was teaching actually came from God. You see, Jesus doesn't need to prove the Bible to every generation by fresh miracles. He's already done it once and for all. He simply expects us to trust what he says already in his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you haven't seen, but you believe because of the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now again, what is it that Jesus expects us to do? He expects us to believe him. He expects us to trust him. He expects us to take him at his word and not to doubt, not to question. And so this text really asks all of us this question, whether or not we really do trust him. Are we more like the Jews who have to see to believe? There's a lot of people that are like that. Or are we more like the centurion who believed Jesus just because Jesus said it? If Jesus says it, is that enough for you? You see, that's really what faith is all about, trusting that what Jesus already said is in fact true. Do you believe Jesus? Now, Jesus says in his word that, that hell exists. Let's, let's apply this now to various 
areas, not the least of which, as I've said before, is evangelism. Jesus says that there is really a fiery hell. Do you believe that what he says is true? Do you believe that hell exists? Now, Jesus says that he has saved you from that hell. That's where you would have gone if it hadn't been for him, if you're trusting him this morning. And he also says that he's willing to save other people from that same hell if they will only trust him. Do, do you believe that is true? Jesus says that heaven exists and that he has prepared a place for you there and for everyone who will put their trust in him. Is that something that you believe? Jesus says that your friends, your family, your neighbors, people who aren't trusting him are actually going to go into that hell. They're going to perish in their sins if they don't repent and trust Jesus. Are you reaching out to them because you know that what Jesus says is true? Jesus says that he's going to reward you if you will actually take the time to reach out to your neighbors and your friends with the gospel and your family members. Do you believe that Jesus has a reward for you and are you seeking that reward? Jesus said, lay up your treasures in heaven, you know, where thieves can't steal. Are you focusing on laying up treasures in heaven by doing what the Lord calls you to do or are you still working on laying up treasures on earth that you're eventually going to have to lose? Jesus says that he will be with you as you go out to share the gospel with others, that he will help you, that he will strengthen you and give you courage. And yes, you know, we all admit it's kind of an intimidating thing, isn't it? Even though the Lord tells us that the fear of man is a snare and that God will actually help us, we still realize there's a measure of fear there, but do you realize he's really not going to take that fear away until you step out in faith and take him at his word and know that he's going to do it. It's not until you actually act upon it that he fulfills that promise and takes the fear away and fills you with courage and fills you with, with concern and love for the lost. So are you stepping out in faith because Jesus has made that promise? He said that he will be with you. Do you believe him? And are you stepping out in faith? Now Jesus also said he's going to bring his lost sheep home through your efforts and mine. In other words, it's, it's not going to be for nothing. It's not, you know, futile. So are you breaking ground? Are you watering? Are you, are you sowing with that expectation that the Lord will, in fact, use your efforts? The Lord says that if you will do this, if you will put him first, seek him first, his kingdom and his righteousness, that he will not only do all of these things for you, but he will also take care of all your needs. You don't have to be concerned. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Do you believe that? And are you willing to take him at his word? Are you willing to trust him? You see, that's again what faith means. That's what it means to live by faith. That's what it means to trust Jesus. Faith, the author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of, of things not seen. You know, the Lord does tell us about a number of things that we don't see in front of our eyes from day to day, and that's why we often lose sight of them. But faith will keep them before our eyes and will keep them real. You don't need a miracle. You don't need a sign from heaven to know that what Jesus said is true. Jesus just simply has to say it. And you know it's true. He's already demonstrated his faithfulness. You just simply need to believe, trust what he says, trust him, act upon his word, and you will see that he will do this, that he is faithful. Now, for those of you who have never trusted Jesus, let me just remind you of one other thing that he said. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Everything that Jesus says is true, including this. There is only one way to the Father. There is only one way to be reconciled to God. There is only one door that leads to heaven. Every other door leads to certain death and destruction. Jesus is the only way. Now, Jesus also said on another occasion that whoever comes to him to receive his life, he will certainly not cast away. You don't have to be afraid that Jesus won't receive you if you come to him. 
Because if you will come to him on his terms, if you will turn from your sins and trust in him, he will be true to his word. He will save you. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, then let's apply this in that way. Trust him now. Don't wait for Jesus to prove himself through a miracle because that's not going to happen. Don't ask him to prove what he has already proven many times in Scripture, but simply take him at his word. Believe what he says is true. Believe that he is able to save you. Believe that he is willing to forgive you of all your sins, receive you into his family, and provide for you a place in heaven. And believing that, turn from your sins and trust him. And the Lord will do it because that's what he said he would do. Now this evening we're going to look a little bit more closely at, at why we can trust Jesus. Why he is so trustworthy, why he is so faithful. And it's because he is God in human flesh. And God cannot change. Whatever the Lord says, he will do because he will never change his mind and that is our hope those of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ that is our hope that we will receive what Jesus actually has told us he will give us from his word well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts this morning